Lee. Hi, Lee. I think it's Lee. Am I pronouncing it right? I remember seeing you before, though. Nice to see you again. Amazing. Okay, so let's dive in. So it's our monthly session. For anyone who is new here, we do work with as many people as possible. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's more people, depending on the session. Um, what we're really doing with subconscious freedom work, just for anyone who's newer here, is that what I specialize in is supporting people and getting to their blind spots of whatever subconscious narratives are generating experiences in their reality that aren't the experiences we want to have anymore, right? It's like those moments that we can feel it's time to grow. It's time to free ourselves from something that has been bugging us from the past. It's time to activate our next level. It's time to finally heal from things that we might have had for decades. So what I support people in doing is getting to the root of what is generating that experience so we can heal it and that each one of you have the freedom to choose differently. Because I'm not healing for anyone. I'm not creating freedom for anyone. What I'm really doing is putting up a mirror essentially so they can see into their blind spots and that they have the power to choose now. They have the power to say, you know what, even though it might have felt like this has been my life, even though it might have felt like this has just been the way the world is for me, now that I see it, I'm choosing differently. So I always tell people the more they get into my work that what is really happening is I'm providing the power to choose. Providing the ability to say, you know what, this isn't who I am, this is who I'm going to now be. Now, a lot of these subconscious narratives, they're coming from things that have happened in our formative years. However, if you watched the live session, I know I've been putting out a lot of content lately, so I might feel like a lot to catch up with. I'm getting some messages about that. I was on fire, right? But um, with putting content out, it was just flowing through. But if you watch the live session, we worked with Amy, who's a part of this community. And something you might have seen that it was on Instagram live and she messaged us in the group after and she was like, you know, I saw some people from my family joining in, so I didn't want to get into the details, but, and we can all resonate with that, right? If I saw like my mom pop in and I'm talking about some stuff, it can feel a little bit like, oh, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. I don't know if I want to share this because that can happen as much as, you know, Rachel and Jackie, you guys are both in this, but it can also feel tough sometimes with parents or family members because we don't want to hurt their feelings by explaining how something might have hurt us. But it also, like on another level, we know in this community that we're not blaming parents. We're not blaming anyone who might have uh, been a catalyst to kicking off that narrative. But we could still feel the things if they sign on when we're talking about these things, right? So in the live session, the reason I'm sharing this is that in the live session, Amy was talking about how she didn't really want to go into the details. But what was amazing about it is when we do the subconscious freedom work, as much as going in the details can help so we can reframe what we made those details mean, because it's not really about the details. It's about what we've made the details mean. It's about us experiencing something as a little kid and making it mean something about ourselves or the world before we know better. So when we're getting in the detail, into the details, that's the reason why. We're getting in the de into the de details so we can transform our own meanings that we've given circumstances before we knew better. However, it's not always necessary. People sometimes come to me and they're like, what if I just don't want to dig up the stuff from the past? <laughs> what if I've done it enough? And like, they feel like they just don't want to go there anymore. It's like, well, to some degree, the subconscious might reveal something that it's time for us to heal. It's time for us to get that part of ourselves. And as you saw in the live session, if you did see it, the live Instagram live, we didn't need to go into any details. We didn't go into any details, but what we did do is we focused on the soul lesson that, which another word for soul lesson is like the deeper lesson for that person. When it's a soul lesson, it's patterns that have been repeating for decades. And it's like, oh, wow, I keep circling around this thing, seeing new perspectives of it. That's what I'm calling that soul lesson. So when we get to the soul lesson, we learn what we're meant to learn and we see the higher perspective, it's not always necessary to get into the details. 
And I think that's refreshing for people sometimes because it's like, oh, healing doesn't always have to be me excavating that stuff. I think, what do you guys feel? I feel like that's refreshing to know we don't always have to go there. Sometimes it can be lighter. Sometimes it can be on the surface. Sometimes it can be easy. Sometimes we just see something and we see the higher perspective and we're like, oh, this is what I'm going to choose now. I see how that perspective has been limiting me. I'm just going to choose differently now. Sometimes it can be easy like that. And sometimes it's time to go into the deep work. But we don't always have to be excavating the deep stuff all the time. And that's a big part of the message I want to share with you guys because it just naturally came up on that live. But is this making sense for everyone? Is this helpful to hear? Like sometimes we don't always have to excavate so deep and it's really like, hey, what am I meant to learn here? And can I show up differently based on the lesson? Can I take new actions based on what I've learned? But sometimes the, the, the hurt has been ingrained for so long that even if we're consciously aware of it, we still take actions, like we still react in the old way. That's when we know it's time to, okay, let's excavate a little bit. Let's go a little deeper so we can transform these automatic reactions. So it's not always necessary to dig up the stuff. And sometimes it's important to, to really create freedom. And all of you are going to find your own unique balance with this. And it's going to be different for all of you. Some of you are going to thrive a lot from digging up the stuff. Because what also happens as you dig up the stuff is that you reparent yourself. You give yourself the love and the attention and the compassion and the support that the younger you wanted the most, that the younger you might have needed at that time. And you become that for you, which is so empowering and so freeing. So sometimes digging up the stuff is a beautiful thing so you can be that for you, which is so empowering and so freeing. And sometimes we don't always want to be digging up the stuff. We want to be a little more active. It's almost like a little more masculine, like a little more just like active. What's the action? Let's move forward. What's the next step? What's the growth? And whether we're feminine or masculine, we lean into that sometimes. It's like, just tell me, tell me the details. Let's go. I want to, I want to just take action and alignment with the next thing. I want to move on from this. I don't want to dig it up right now. I don't want to be in the feelings and dig it up right now. I want to take the new action. I want to see progress. I want to see results. Can you guys feel this? Like, and it's okay if we veer toward one style of healing or the other, it's just what style works for us. And also knowing that even if one style works for us, it's okay to lean into a different style sometimes. It creates some balance. It creates some ease, right? So what we're doing with the subconscious freedom work is we're getting to these root identities. We're getting to these stories that we might not realize are actually impacting our reality in a big way. Something that I share with the mastermind group all the time is that we're living in a world of words. And when we learn the words that the world is made of, we can make of it what we wish. But it's not just the conscious world of words. It's those subconscious world of words that I call narratives and identities. You sometimes see me go back and forth. It's the subconscious world of words that we might have agreed to before we knew better. That we might have made a circumstance mean because of something that has happened. So what I mean by we might have agreed to it before we knew better, we might have just watched how our parents handled love and we're like, oh, that's how love works. So that means we made a subconscious agreement to how love will work before we knew better, just as a kid. And that subconscious agreement might not serve the way you wanna live authentically. And that's when on the surface, it's, it's like, you know, I keep going through the same relationship issues. <laughs> that's how we know we might have had this some kind of a subconscious agreement 
that is playing out in our relationships today. And this can happen in anything. It's like you might make a subconscious agreement with money or with success or with the idea of entrepreneurship or the idea of what's possible for you in success just from observing. I had a client I worked with somewhat recently who she couldn't figure out why she couldn't quite get to that next level in business because consciously she knew all the stuff. She knows this work, right? She knows the subconscious freedom work and she's good at it too. She's actually a coach. She's been trained by me. She's good at what she does and she knows this work. She also knows the business stuff. She has the mindset for it. It's all there consciously, but she couldn't quite figure out why why does she keep hitting this glass ceiling in her business? And what she discovered is that she observed her mom go after her dreams and it not work out. So she observed her mom as this starving artist archetype that would go after her dreams, but then it would be very, very stressful. So what she agreed to subconsciously before she knew better was that if I go after my dreams, it won't work. And not only will it not work, it will be very, very hard. So she was swimming around this world of just learning and learning and learning and not quite going for it. And she was starting to get really hard on herself because she's like, why aren't I just freaking going for it? I know it. I know I can do this. Why aren't I just going? And it's because she had a subconscious narrative that if she went for her dreams, it wouldn't work. So kind of like, what's the point? Is this making sense? So this was, this was just something that she agreed to before she knew better. Created freedom, she created freedom from that. And she's like, oh my gosh, I can just go now. I can just do it. I can just go after the things. Because that narrative that was subconsciously, she wasn't aware of it, that narrative that was playing out, she got to create healing in, she got to free herself from. On the other side of that, she could just go. She could just fly. So sometimes it's a narrative that we agreed to before we knew better. Sometimes it's a deeper identity. So a deeper identity gets generated when we go through an experience and that experience might have been tough. We didn't know how to process it. So we made that experience mean something about us. I'll give you a little example of that and then we'll get right into it, okay? But I always like to share these things because I want to remind you guys what we're really doing here so you can bring it into your own life, so you can listen in a different way to these sessions. You know, it's like, ooh, is that a narrative that I might have or might I have a narrative similar to that? Or you watch me get to an identity with someone and you're like, ooh, my identity is not quite that, but I can resonate with it. I can, I can make some shifts already because I kind of resonate with that. Are you guys following? So that's why I'm doing a little bit of teaching before each session. So the narrative is just like this idea, just like that, that woman I worked with who is a coach had this narrative that what's the point of going after my dreams because it won't work anyway, right? Because she saw that happen with her mom over and over and over. Not only would it not work, it would be really, really, really stressful and hard. So we could see why she wasn't just going for it, right? Because it's kind of like, what's the point? I don't want it to be that hard. Let's just go get a job over here. So it's not that hard, right? Okay, identities, like I was saying before, are a little different. Identities are deeper. The stories live more on the surface, but if we think of it like a funnel, the story would not be there if there wasn't an identity that matched that, okay? So... The identities are generating all of it. They're like, they're a little more powerful. They're generating a bunch of stories to exist within an identity, okay? This is also why sometimes you might hear someone talking about a limitation and it doesn't matter to you. Like you can hear a friend tell you something and it's not doing anything. It's not triggering anything in you because you don't have an identity that that would trigger, so you can be a little more like observant. Maybe you can be very helpful for that person because you're not in the same identity and you can just see into their blind spots. You give great advice to them because you don't have something similar. But if you have something similar, that's when a friend might talk to you and it could trigger you. It's not even your life and your circumstance, but it's like, oh shit, this is like, 
I'm not comfortable in this conversation. You know, I just want to get away from them or I just want to get out of this. Or I just want to tell them to like, get over it. It's like, it's like uncomfortable in that situation. That's when we have an identity that could match that. Okay. So an identity is created when we have some kind of circumstance happen that we don't necessarily know how to process, but we make that circumstance mean something about us. We don't know any better. As a kid, we're processing a lot and we're not taught this. Many of us aren't taught this in our formative years. I know I wasn't. We're not taught, oh, honey, it's okay. This was just an experience. It didn't mean anything about you. It just happened. But how freeing is it when we learn that? So an identity is a little different. I'll give you an, ex an example now. So for example, I worked with a man who was in his 70s and he was a grandfather and he was noticing that his, he, he was studying this work more and he was noticing that his identities, like something that was hurting him, got passed down to his son who was responding in a very similar way. Like they would trigger each other in a very similar circumstance. But then he saw that that was not only passed down from him, that it was being passed down to the grandkids. And he's like, oh my goodness, I really want to be the one to heal this. Because he noticed the impact it was making on generations. And he's like, if I don't do this now, then they're going to have to. And, and, and he, he felt the pressure of it. But I want to remind people right now that Things aren't passed down to family members if they don't agree to it. You know, they agree to it. It's like, let's do this together type of energy. It's not the energy of like, grandpa did it to me. It's this energy of I've agreed to it because I want to learn too. Sometimes we forget that. A lot of parents put way too much pressure on themselves and they forget that there's a lot of agreement, agreements on all sides of things. Okay, let's bring it back to the example. So he was in his 70s and he could see that any time that his... Um, his son or his grandkids borrowed something from him, it would trigger him a lot if they didn't put it back in the right place or if they scuffed it up or if they broke something, it triggered him a lot, right? He really felt like they were disrespecting him in that moment. And he felt like, why can't you just do what I say? You know, like, do you just not care? Do you just not care about me? Do you just not give a shit? So he felt very disrespected if they put something back in the wrong place or they didn't take care of the things that they were borrowing. And guess what would happen on their side of things? On their side of things, on the son's side of things, he created an identity that he couldn't do anything right. Are you guys seeing how this stuff passes down? So his identity, I'll get to it in a second, his identity caused him to get triggered whenever they would not respect his things. The way that, that the son perceived the identity was that I can't do anything right because no matter what I do, dad always points something out to me. Are you guys following how these things start getting passed down? So what he realized was that he got really overblown in a situation. He got very, very triggered in a situation when the grandson then broke something, broke one of the ATVs or something that they were using. The grandson broke it. And the dad who had a trigger of not being able to do anything right with his dad was like, you know what? I'll take the blame. So then it became this whole family thing. <laughs> Are you following? Because the grandson's hiding something and not wanting to show up. The dad is trying to take the blame and making it a bigger deal. And the grandpa's getting triggered because he thinks that they're disrespecting him. And now they're lying to him, which makes him even more mad. Are you guys seeing how family dynamics play out with all of these triggers? It's wild. So I worked with the grandfather who I have so much respect for because this was deep, right? This was ingrained in him. And I worked with him and what it came down to was when he was little, his parents took his beloved pet from him because his pet was sick. And his parents took this pet from him without telling him and then the next day they just said, we took it to the farm. But his older siblings very quickly told him, they didn't take it to the farm, it died. And what he made that mean was that he just doesn't matter. If people are just taking my things that are loving to me and lying to me about it, then I just must be a, like nothing to them. I must just not matter. 
So now we could see why it was specifically his things that this was tied up with. Because it was his parents who took his pet, his thing, without telling him, and he just made that mean that he doesn't matter. So identities get created when a situation happens that's very challenging and we make it mean something about us. So his parent took the pet without telling him. It was just that generation. You know, think about a man in his 70s now and his parents. It was just that generation. They didn't, a lot of them didn't take time for the kids. The kids were like out of sight, out of mind. Like, just get out of here. That's how a lot of that generation treated kids at that time. Very different. Not all of them. I don't want to overgeneralize. But it was like a little bit for a lot of them, like out of sight, out of mind kind of energy. So it was just, it went to the farm, suck it up. That's it. That was the conversation my dad had. Or that that the, the, the dad had with his dad. So that was the conversation that the dad had with his dad. Just suck it up. Okay, so when he figured out that that identity was I don't matter, he very quickly got to heal the version of him that learned that. And then from healing the version of him that learned that, he then got to see that his parents doing that doesn't mean he doesn't matter. That he could never not matter. That the whole universe conspired for him to exist. Of course he couldn't not matter. He matters so much that the entire universe conspired for him to exist as he is right now. He exists. That's all he needs to know to know he matters. So when he could see that, it was a profound awakening moment. He's like, all of this studying I've been doing in spirituality, knowing God, spiritually growing, he's like, I can feel it now. He's like, I can actually feel it. Now that I know I don't not matter, I can actually feel oneness with the divine right now. So then from the other side of things, he realized that he was tying up his identity mattering with his things. From the other side of that, he was able to show up with his family differently. He was able to teach his son after that, that he could never do anything wrong. And he wasn't responding to him in that way because he thought he was doing anything wrong. He was responding to him in that way because of how he felt. Now his son could heal the feeling of not doing anything wrong, which could then heal the grandkid. Are you guys following this? So him in his 70s, and I love these stories of people who are kind of... Um, at later points in their lives creating healing because there's so many people who create these narratives as if, as if, well, if it's there for too long, they can't heal it. And it's just not true. It might be a little more ingrained and he had to do a little more effort because it was there for seven decades. But in two months time, he was completely clear of it. He was responding in different ways. He wasn't getting triggered anymore. He was supporting his son to heal, who was then supporting his, um, his, his kid to heal, his grandkid to heal. It took a little bit of time and a little bit of effort of going back and forth, a little bit of training. But before he knew it, in his 70s, no longer triggered by this and helping his son and grandson. Isn't that beautiful? It's just so special. But it's just a representation of how when you heal, you support the healing of everyone around you. When you heal, and you no longer have those identities, what it becomes is like an open door for the people around you to no longer get triggered by the same old stuff, to no longer like need to react to you a certain way because you're triggered by something, so they adapt. It's like when you heal, you become a renegade in the healing of everyone around you. And sometimes the people around you aren't quite ready to step through that door, right? They're not quite ready. But at least you know that your work is becoming an open door for everyone around you. And that's what's really going on here, which is just so special, isn't it? Okay, so subconscious narratives, these are things we decide more that are a little more surface level, like that client who decided that um, being an entrepreneur isn't going to be easy and also like just won't work, right? Just going after her dreams won't work. That was a story. That was a narrative. 
the identities are what we make something mean about us. Like the grandfather who thought that he didn't matter, that people putting his stuff back in the wrong place, things like that, meant that he didn't matter. And then he cleared that. He realized, of course he matters. He taught that to the younger version of him, no longer triggered by that and also helping the people around him. Those are identities. When a story shifts or a narr narrative shifts, it can be a little lighter. It might be a big reality shift depending on like what next level comes after that narrative shifts, but it's a little bit lighter. It's not always going into the deep, deep stuff. An identity gets into the deep stuff, right? Making sense? We have the difference, the distinction? Okay, so that's what I'm working within with people and that's what we'll get into tonight and that's what we're always doing. When you come, when any of you who are joining the Subconscious Freedom Mastermind that starts this Saturday, I invite all of you, if you can swing it, to join in because this is the place where I train you in the ins and outs of this. There are multiple modalities that come with this that support the freedom from any subconscious stories or identities. There are things like creating freedom from triggers. There are things, and like actually using triggers to heal you, changing behaviors from the subconscious root we get into becoming magnetic and actually using manifestation practices that work and healing any subconscious limitations that get in the way of the manifestation so that you just become magnetic. So the subconscious freedom mastermind is the thing to step into when you really want to go all in on this. And you were like, I am so ready to create freedom for my subconscious limitations. Not only am I ready for this, but I'm ready to learn how to do this for myself, right? That's what the mastermind is for. It starts this Saturday. Now, there's a level two of the mastermind that starts this Saturday for coaches and healers or anyone who wants to spread this work to others, okay? That one is great for when you want to learn these modalities to actually use them on others. In level one, you learned how to use them on yourself. In level two, you learn how to use them on yourself, but you also learn how to guide other people through it, Okay. So that starts Saturday and I invite you guys to come in for whoever really wants to be a part of that. It's an amazing six month journey. It is a profound space to be in. And if any of you listening to this, if anyone's watching the recording, I know we have hundreds of people who watch that. It's not gonna be available for the people on the recording, but anyone who's here live, if you really wanna be a part of this, but finances truly get in the way, just message me, okay? I'm always having sliding scale opportunities for people who really, really want to be a part of it, okay? So if anyone really, really has financial issues in the way, but really, really wants to be a part of it, just email me personally and we'll make something happen for you. But if financial issues aren't a thing and you just email me for it, that's not what this is for, right? But it is for, for, for people who really need the support. I'm always making this work accessible to people. I just want you guys to know that, okay? And since you're here with me live, you're getting that opportunity, but you've got to message me within the next day or I won't see it by Saturday. It starts Saturday. Okay. So just make sure to email me within the next 24 hours and we'll make something happen for you if you really can't swing it, but you really want to be a part of it. Make sense for everyone? That's a thank you for you being here live and showing up every month. Okay. Awesome. All right, so let's get into it. So what we do tonight is a part of this. I want you guys to just go ahead and start raising your hands. You know the deal, the hands are raised. Um, I did promise Deborah some support if it's still alive for her. Um, so Deborah, would you like to come up if that's still relevant for you? Um, I can um, ask you to unmute, that might be helpful for you. Here okay. You so. Hi. I love what you said. It really um, resonated, both of it, both of the things you talked about. I'm not 100% sure uh, what exactly is going on with me. I just turned 65. I'm a new grandmother. Love life. I love myself. Um, I'm, I love what I do. But there are these things that happen like just I wanted to go on zoom on my laptop and I I I I don't know I just blind blind I can't figure out how to do the simplest things and then I get really frustrated and I don't call myself a business person I I sort of pull away from business I've always had um part-time jobs <laughs> to supplement because I didn't like that full-time thing and uh what was the other thing 
anyway, we'll just start there. Like, I, I'm not sure what stops me. Oh yeah. My body, I, I don't move my body and I'm, I'm having health issues. And I find that there's a freezing thing that happens with me as well. And I love to dance and once in a while I'll do it for like a minute and then I stop and there's no real flow with what I really, what I believe. And also you talked about dreams, following your dreams. I don't, I don't really have dreams. I just really enjoy life. I think it's amazing. I love being human. <laughs> and how that's going to turn out, we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So it sounds like some things are really beautiful. You know, congratulations on your little one. You. Really beautiful. So, and I can tell that you have, you know, a lot of love in you and a lot of beautiful energy. Like you radiate a lightness, it doesn't feel too heavy. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't feel like you're carrying a lot of heaviness. Do you feel like you carry a lot of he heaviness? I'm not really sensing that. Not, no, not really. Yeah. Um, and no. you said that you do healing work as well, right? But you have yeah. side jobs that supplement it. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And that's when you had these few themes that you mentioned. So if I'm hearing you correctly, there's one theme that's like, you don't, you didn't like calling yourself a business person. So you would get side jobs and then certain moments where like, for example, you tried to open zoom on your computer and then something froze, like you just froze and you were like, okay, no, just. It something. happens all the time. <laughs> and then the same thing for like dancing, like something kind of in the way of getting into flow, like that flow and rhythm of dance of just like letting go and letting yourself express in that way. Yeah. Okay. So which one, I think I've, I know they're all related or your intuition wouldn't have brought them up, mm -hmm. but which one feels like it's most impacting your life right now? Well, the job I have now, I'm, I'm a, companion for a 95 year old woman and I, I love her and the reason that came into my life is because my mom died during COVID and I thought you know what I really want to experience grief and that so I just sort of put business on hold uh, I said I'll do still do referrals but just just get it and this job came and I met this woman and I feel like I've known her forever mm -hmm. and so I've been working with her for three years and I adore her but she's getting to the end, you know, she's really tired of life. And so part of me is thinking, okay, <laughs> it's time to really bump up the business mm -hmm. work. And I'm not even sure how that's going to look, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I'm great with people. I, you know, I do groups and things like that, but how to, like, I even had a guided meditation scheduled tonight and nobody, nobody even showed. And mm -hmm. in the past, my place would be full. And mm -hmm. so my energy is um, something, something. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, 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 there's something there for sure. You know, there's something there. Okay, so let's go into the business side of things. I think they're all connected, but especially because that's what you brought up intuitively, right? You're, you're having this experience, which is just so beautiful that you're ushering someone to cross over and you're yeah. there for them. That's, that's a really beautiful thing to do. So I just want to honor you for that because it's, it's a really beautiful thing to do. Right. And it can also bring up honored. a lot too. What? Yeah. I feel honored. I feel honored to be able to be there for her. It's it's a beautiful gift. It is. It's really special yeah. and it's really needed. And I think that um, we don't really have that incorporated into society on a big scale. And I'm just, it's very moving to know you're doing that. So thank you for doing that. So Deborah, okay. So tell me about for you in relationship to business, why have you not called it a business? Because I, I don't really have a business mind. It's mm -hmm. it, money is uncomfortable to me. Mm -hmm. I actually, it's oh, okay. So recently I bumped into someone uh, twice, just randomly in, in a week. I hadn't seen her in years. And, um, I started, I, I thought I had this great idea. This was many years ago and, and uh, she wanted to be involved. And I said, okay, I have reluctantly let's get involved. And I let her do the money thing because I don't like it. And she ended up taking it and no more oh, business. Sorry. Oh, well, <laughs> part of me was relieved because you know, it wasn't something that I like to do. Mm -hmm. and I want to change that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one level is like a lot of people, especially people who are associated with healing and are a little more tuned into the feminine, they don't resonate with how business used to be. Plus 
obviously we all have our own stories about what business is and what money is. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really going on, right? It's not that Deborah doesn't like business and doesn't like money and doesn't have a business mindset. It's that Deborah doesn't like her own stories about these things. Okay. Does this make sense? Yeah. Is that landing? Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I have a story. Yeah. 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 And I, I want to bring it out to the group because this is an empowering moment when we realize these things, because we could carry for decades that business isn't for us or money isn't for us or that a relationship isn't for us. Things like this. We create these ideas about something because we think that thing just isn't for us when really it's our own story about the thing that we don't like. Right? Because these things outside, they're neutral. It's our stories about them that are causing us to not want to lead into them. So for, for you personally, Deborah, we're going to come back and we'll get into this today and we'll see what we un uncover tonight. But the first invitation just for you to take with you even on your own is to start to dissect what you think it means to run a business, what you think it means to make money, these things. Because it's in the meaning that you're going to be able to take your power back and choose to define these things for yourself. Okay. Making sense? Yeah. So, however, it's probably, it's been there for quite some time, but we know that there's a part of your spirit that wants to free yourself from this. One, because you're talking to us about it right now, right? That's obvious. But also you had a big moment with this other person that mm -hmm. you just said, handle it. If you didn't want to learn something from that and overcome it, it would have just went well, you know, mm -hmm. it would have mm -hmm. just, she, it would have been easy. It would have went well. You would have never had to deal with it. But because there's such contrast in that experience, it's a big insight for us, isn't it? It's like, she just took it. It's like a, a sense of betrayal. It's a really moment of like, wait a minute, let's pay attention to this. You yeah. know, what that shows me is that you're, you're, there's a part of you that really wants to overcome this, that wants to transform this. Yeah. So yeah. for you, when it comes to business and money, there might be some different stories around it. But what is your idea? Like, what are your meanings about business that makes you not like it or makes you think you don't have a business mind? I love what I do. Just last weekend, I had a client and after she left, I'm cleaning up and she buzzed my apartment. She goes, oh, I forgot to pay you. And I forgot to ask, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I just really am passionate about what I do. And, and I, I get so much back. It just feels weird to me sometimes to ask for money. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So when it comes to business, you feel like you don't have a business mindset when it comes to asking for money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's lean into the money because you love what you do and you can provide a great service and you feel good about that part. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Now, one thing is that in spiritual work, we do get a lot from working with people. We do. It's like me hopping on here and doing things for free and offering sliding scales. It's because I do. I love it. So I resonate with you a lot with that, Deborah. And I've been through something similar as well. Right. And there was a period of time where people who were the healers, they didn't take money for it. Yeah. Right. But what would happen is that the whole community would provide what they need. Mm -hmm. Right. The healers wouldn't take money for it. They would do it for free. And the, com the community would give them food and give them housing and things like this. But that's not how it is anymore, is it? No. Well, for now, I, I would like for it to change and we really honor everyone's different roles. I would like for money not to be what it is, but what we get to do is redefine what it is for ourselves. So we start shifting it, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just wanted to speak to that because I resonate with you and I get what it what it's like to be in a role like this. However, could you agree that money is important for us today and to live in this society? Yes. Yeah. And it's important that we now redefine our own relationships to it so that more money, I'm going to speak more generally, but I want more money to be in the hands of people with these beautiful hearts like you, because you're going to invest in things that will make this world better. 
You're going to invest in people and things, and you're going to put your money back into things that nurture your community, that nourish us all, right? But could you imagine with if all of these people with beautiful spiritual hearts, which has happened for the past few thousand years, all of these people with beautiful spiritual hearts thinking, oh, no, it's bad to ask for money for this. Yeah. No. It makes a lot of spiritual people with a lot, not a lot of money. Yeah. And then they can't really do what they want to do. Exactly. We've got yeah. to shift this. Mm -hmm. Because if I didn't make money for what I do, I wouldn't be able to, Deborah, spend all of my time getting better and better at it. Yeah. So when people invest in this work, they're not only investing in this work for themselves, they're investing in someone who gets to then spend their time refining their craft and getting even better at it, right? But that's the same for you. When people invest in you, they're investing in you becoming a clear vessel even more. Because when they're investing in you, Deborah, what they're investing in is you being able to take care of yourself differently. Uh, when you're not on sessions with them, mm -hmm. right? You can invest in the best food and the best supplements and the best healing abilities so that you can be healing yourself when you're not on sessions, which is what I'm doing a lot of the time, right? If I'm not serving people, I'm off red light therapy, things like this to support my yeah. own vessel, you too, right? But yeah. it costs money to do those things, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It does. Yeah. So it's important to shift this. Mm -hmm. So what did you learn about money that makes you not want to ask for it? Well, I remember asking for a kid uh, when I was a kid, money for things. My, my mm -hmm. father just wasn't around and my mom would always say, we can't afford it. We can't, no, we can't afford it. And mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I mean, I, I managed to raise two kids on my own and, you That's know, amazing and work I, the, what I, I learned I decided to dive into the healing so that I could have more time like I, I'm one of those mothers that wants to be with their kids all the time so um, I mean I think I did pretty good however <laughs> I gotta do better now you know I have a grandson now too you know mm -hmm. and so it just feels like I do want to get out there more yeah yeah, you did amazing. And you. I'm glad you spoke that out because you definitely give, get to give yourself so much credit. That's a superhero, a, mo a single mom, like raising your kids on your own and figuring it out. That's a huge thing. And it, you do get to give yourself so much credit for that. So I'm glad you spoke it out. It's an important thing to honor big time. I have a lot of respect for that. And this business thing is going to be easy when we clear this out. Okay. You did that, Deborah. the business stuff. You can do anything. <laughs> Like any mom out there, I always say that, like you did that, this other stuff is a cakewalk, you've got it. But we've got to clear our own meanings around these things so that it becomes easy. So we can see that for ourselves too, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so your dad wasn't around, you mentioned, and you did ask for money, right? So you did when you were little, but you were met with, we don't, we can't afford that, right? right? Okay. So when it comes to asking for money in your spiritual business or healing business, like, can we call it a healing business? Yeah. Or your healing practice? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm, that's another thing I want to work on. It's like, what am I going to call it? I want to call it something more um, appropriate since I've grown in such a way that's different from what I first started. Yeah. You, you, that, that'll be, that'll come too. The more you clear out like your connection with your business, you'll, that name will come. I resonate with that a lot too. I'm always redoing that. I think it's important that we all do um, mm -hmm. as we grow. Okay. So um, Deborah, so when it comes to asking for your, mo for money in your spiritual practice, like the person who came, you forgot to ask, right? And she forgot to pay you and you forgot to ask because it was so rich. It was a rich experience. You're not thinking about it. Why did you forget to ask? I don't think about money very often. Mm -hmm. But why? What do you think about it that makes you not think about it? You know, I still think after all these years, and I just want to preface by saying I can look in a mirror now and just think I'm awesome. I mean, I love myself. But even with that and all these years, I still don't think I'm good enough. I still mm -hmm. don't think I'm making an impact that I want to make or 
that I could make or something like that. Okay. So you think you're not asking for money because you think you're not good enough to get the money? Yeah, I, I, I'm. That's that's what's coming to me now. When people tell me what a, an a effect I've made on them or what a difference in their lives, what what we did together did, I don't fully believe it. Mm -hmm. Part of me thinks, oh, well, that's you know, I don't know. Okay. Okay. So a part of you doesn't fully believe like, oh, wow, like I am making this impact. This is happening. I am supporting people in this way. So a little bit of like wanting to do a better job or wanting to do a good job. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to money, I also want to check in on this because what were some stories you learned about money itself? I've known a lot of wealthy people in my life. I even put my daughter through Waldorf school for 11 years by cleaning the school. And wow. so most of her friends are wealthy and I've known them, you know, and um, didn't like them. <laughs> there were things about them that, that I didn't like, I guess. And what was it? What were those things? And I appreciate your awareness and honesty. So what were those things that you didn't like? What stuck out to you? Fake or condescending to me. Um, okay. Yeah. So people with money are what in Deborah's eyes? Not real. Yeah. Oh. So if someone with your constitution who feels very authentic to me, it feels like authenticity and like being you is a high point of integrity for you. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So someone who holds themselves to that standard, would they, do you think that person would want to get more of the thing that would make them fake? No, <laughs> no. Of course. Yeah. So forgetting to ask for money makes sense then. Because mm -hmm. if you think, well, me, as soon as I bring in money, I become less authentic. I become more fake then do you think you would want to ask for it on a session where there's such divinity happening and such a beautiful exchange? No. No, of course not, right? So then let's go into this a little bit. Do you think, from this perspective of us talking right now, do you think it's really the money that makes them fake? No. No. What is it that actually makes them come across as fake? Well, part of it is, is my lesson that I need to learn from them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they, they have their own pain. They have their own story. Yeah. Insecurities, right? Yeah. Any, anyone who's being fake and not authentic, it's just insecurity, mm -hmm. right? And perhaps that insecurity would also make sense if you're attracting some people who are a little, make you feel condescending. Mm -hmm. Conde like like they're condescending right but I like mm -hmm. that you responded that it's your lesson right of course it is yeah. of course it is because it's all coming from our perspective so if you think that people with money are fake then what's a lie about that sentence I think yeah yeah that's great but what else is a lie is it what what else is inaccurate about it is it the money that makes them fake no. No. What no. is it? It's their life, how they see the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and now that I'm thinking about it, a lot of times people felt really uncomfortable around me mm -hmm. because of who I was. I was called the huggy chick or the hippie chick or, you know, <laughs> and people felt uncomfortable around me. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a little bit of a different energy, a little bit of the different energy, but it feels like you've integrated that in a, in a nice way. I don't sense that in you a lot, but yeah, of course, like right? people are going to feel what they feel based on their own perspectives and their own perspectives and things like this. However, is it that people with money are fake? Not necessarily, no. No. Just some people do come across as fake because of what's going on with them, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Do you think there's some people with money who are very authentic? Yes. Do you think there's some people with money who are really doing a lot of good things in the world? Amazing. Yes. Yeah. And are some people with money not doing good things in the world? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but is yeah. it the money that's doing that? No. No. What we can think of money as is it's just an amplifier. That's it. Because the more money someone has, the more they have to ex to show how much they have. Okay? So as soon as someone has more money, we start seeing what's really important to someone. Because if someone has a lot of money and they spend it on all of these things and flashy things and they, they're fake and you can see it more, it's just because they're showing more of who they are. Mm -hmm. But if someone has a lot of money and they're wearing the same t-shirt every day and they're walking around and and... and building schools and building homes for people and building, we're seeing more of who their heart is. Right. So money actually could be an amplifier for Deborah's authenticity, which is what she actually likes a lot about herself, isn't it? Yeah. So does money have to mean that you would be more fake if you had it? No. What else could I it mean? Well, the thing that's coming to me now is I don't feel smart enough. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's that other piece, right? We veered into the money side of things, but just to close this loop first, what else could money mean for you, Deborah? I mean, if I had it more of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm doing great. Uh, yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah. Well, more of it for your business, for your work. What else could it mean for you in that way? If you had more of it, what could you do with it? I could open a center, you know, <laughs> that's always what I wanted to do. Coming from someone in the beginning of the call who said she doesn't have dreams. True. <laughs> Isn't that something? Yeah. You do. It's just the dreams didn't match the version of you who thought money would make things make you more inauthentic would make you fake get rid of right. that narrative and all of a sudden i would open a center that's kind yeah. of special isn't it you do have yeah. a dream it's right there and centers are quite important because they spread the work it's a physical space that continues to spread the work that leads a legacy which is quite special yeah so deborah could open a center when she knows that she is free to make more money because all money is is an amplifier of who she is. Mm. Different world, huh? Yeah, and I love that word, the, the way you've said it, amplifier of who I am, yeah. It's all it is. It's an energy. Mm -hmm. And what does more energy do? It amplifies what's there. And that, yeah. Deborah has a dream, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah, she does. Let's go. It's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. Okay, now let's go into the other layer of this, right? But I want you to I want you to remember this and know that that is another workshop. Now you get to remind yourself regularly, reprogram that in your mind. Money is an amplifier. Making money is easy for me. I love the opportunity to build wealth because I know I'm going to do amazing things with it. When someone's investing in me, they're investing in a dream that will support us all. It's important to remember. When someone's yeah. investing in you, Deborah, they're investing in that dream of that center that's going to leave a legacy, that's going to help so many more people, that's going to make the bigger impact that you and your heart said a few moments ago that you really want to make the bigger impact. Right? So this is something to reprogram moment by moment to shift your mindset around money, redefining it, and also redefining what it gets to do in your world. It gets to be that amplifier for you. And it's bringing your dreams alive on a new level, isn't it? Thanks. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. So now let's go into this other piece. And this is big for, for healers as well, because there's an interesting dynamic when we're supporting people to heal. Because it's not really us that's doing it. And we know that, right? 
We know that. Yeah. It's them that's doing it. And beyond that, it's the divine, whatever word we use, source, God, the universe, there is an undercurrent of love and healing that is always there. And we're becoming just a vessel for that. We're being a mirror to their own genius, right? Their own healing capacities. And we know that. So it is kind of silly or strange when someone says, you've helped me so much, isn't it? It's very like, strange. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know that feeling. It's like, what do you mean? You did it. Yeah. I always respond to people that way. I'm like, I didn't do it. You did it, right? Yeah. However, there is something important to be aware of because you've had to study to be a you that can hold space for that, didn't you? Yeah, I did. You've had to do a lot of inner work and to be a healer, to hold space, it is an everyday commitment of life. Yeah. Right? Because if we're not holding, if we're not healing ourselves and putting ourselves in the position to hold space, then that doesn't flow through as good as it can, does it? No. And that's what you get to honor. Mm. More. It took a lot for you to step into a role as a healer. And it continues to every day. And you get to honor that in you. It does take work for us to be a vessel for others. And it does take a high level of authenticity and integrity and constant refinement on ourselves to do so. And Deborah gets to give herself so much more credit for that. Because as much as you know it's them that's doing it, you are still holding up the mirror mm -hmm. and you are still the vessel that it takes a lot to be that vessel for that. And you get to honor that about you. Yeah. Right. Now, when it comes to not being enough in sessions, tell me where that comes from. Hmm. Well, I think it just comes from how I was raised and the belief system I still have. Like my mother would literally tell me to stop talking. Mm. And I always wanted to talk about joy. In my family, we were always negative and talking about each other. So I would talk about myself because something amazing happened and I wanted to share it. But I was told to stop talking. <laughs> mm. And what did that make what did that make Deborah decide about herself? Um, well, first of all, I don't want to be around my family. <laughs> But yeah, maybe I'm too much, you know, maybe I'm, you know, I mean, I seem, seem pretty quiet right now, but I can be very passionate, you know, mm -hmm. and loud sometimes when I'm talking about something that really brings joy to me. Yeah. And so I feel like I can be a bit much for people. Okay. So when you think about being a bit much, why, how does that energy show up in your business and in your work with people? Hmm. Well, not so much. I don't know. Like, I don't do it that much. It's like a few sessions a week and stuff like that. But um, when I do circles, I just get really passionate and talk about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Mm hmm. And when you get really passionate in circles and talk about what you're doing, how do you feel after? Hi. Yeah. Yeah. My body gets really warm and I just feel amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's you, it's you align with your soul mission for sure. Now, how do you feel when you talk about marketing it? Ugh. <laughs> yeah. Do you I, feel like you don't want to be too much there? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's where it shows up. Yes, that's it. Okay. I mean, I just pretty much do um, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that can be sustaining. You know, the universe protects and it really does. It makes things work in ways that work for us. Like if you if you don't want to be a huge marketer, that's okay. But we definitely want to clear out any any limitations that are causing you to not just share the work. Yes. No, I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So now when it comes to Deborah and her relationship with her family, 
who was the one who would usually say you're too much? Was it mom? I think I remember you saying mom would respond to you that way. And um, my my mom's gone now. So I'm the matriarch of my family. It's just me and my sister and she's younger. Mm -hmm. um, she's coming around. She's starting to see certain things about me. But now that you've brought this up, it's I think it's just all about me, how I mm -hmm. feel about my family and the things, you know, I want them to see life a certain way, but they are who they are and I love them who they are, but sometimes I can't be around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And why? Because how, how are you seeing them? How are you feeling about you when you see them? We'll ask that question. That's the thing. Do I always ask myself, do I love myself? How do I feel about myself when I'm with these people? Mm -hmm. You know, and what am I thinking? And I always ask myself that and I don't like my thoughts sometimes around the judgment, mm -hmm. you know, it's very, very little now for sure. I've done so mm -hmm. much work on myself, accepting them for who they are is, is getting easier and easier. Um, but my family really shrunk after my mom died. Other parts of people don't talk to us. So it's just me and my sister and her kids and yeah. my kids. That's it, right. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah, okay. So uh, you've worked on a lot of judgments toward them and it's gotten easier over the years and it's even smaller, so probably a bit easier to manage now too. But what is Deborah left feeling about herself when she's in that environment with them? They're showing me how I still judge myself and I judge them mm -hmm. and it's something that I want to lessen something I really want to look at judgment doesn't feel good in my body you know yeah yeah for sure for sure and it is very very ingrained in the civilization for sure and this is powerful that you're doing this work now mm -hmm. so so when it comes to Deborah being too much right that's what you mentioned that that's kind of like how she, how young version of you felt like she was too much Right, because she was constantly told to sh I, things like that, right? So if someone felt like they were being too much, then what do what are they saying about who they are? They're not good enough. Not good enough. That's definitely there, right? Mm -hmm. But if someone's even not good enough or saying something is too much, then what is inherently going on about that being? What do they actually think about themselves? judging myself for being what though too loud too passionate i i, I don't if know something's too loud it's okay it's meant to be a blind spot right that's this mm -hmm. is what we're doing so if something's too loud and too passionate then what are we saying about it it's what not normal not normal. So we're getting we're getting closer, right? And if something's not normal, then what is it? I I don't know. If something is normal, then what would we say about that thing? Oh, we accept it, and it's okay. Because we accept it, it's okay. But if something's not normal, what might we say about it? Or why isn't it normal? Because it's what? Triggering. It's, it's triggering. Not normal. It just makes me feel like I'm on the outskirts all the time. Sometimes, yeah. you know. And it also sounds like I'm talking like when I was little because I don't care a lot about this stuff anymore. Yeah, you've managed and you've done a lot of healing, right? But the, yeah. the remnants of it is what we're talking about, which is why it sounds like you're talking about like when you were little. It's just right. remnants, right? You've done a lot of healing work and you've managed this and you've figured out how to deal with it and transform a lot. But the remnants of it is what we're here to do. So if I someone's wanted, on wanted... the outskirts all the time, what are we saying about that thing? Who must that thing be to themselves? That they what? I, well, I, I want to be more, I want to be accepted. And why isn't someone accepted?
because I'm not, because they're not like the other people. They're different. Yeah. They're yes. triggering, you know? Yes. Yeah. So what I want you to feel into, which one resonates more with you is either I'm different or I don't belong. I don't belong. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense for someone because I feel like you've healed the aspects that think they're different and you've actually honored the differences you have. Mm -hmm. But I don't belong is what I'm hearing more in the world of like, think about the words you said before. I feel like I'm always on the outskirts. Yeah. And if someone thinks they don't belong, then they would want to be accepted. And they also wouldn't feel like they can be their authentic selves with them so their judgment would be on hyper gear because it's like, well, maybe if I can just either figure out what's wrong with them so that I don't feel so bad and it's their fault, not mine, right? Or let me figure out about them so that I can try to adapt to fit. But if authenticity is a key, then it's more like, well, what do I do other than just think it's on them? Right. Right. Because you're not willing to change yourself and you don't want to have to. No. Yeah. So it makes more sense then just as a protective mechanism to be like, well, it must be them. Which is why I don't belong. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So how have you adapted to not belonging? I spend a lot of time alone. I like being alone, <laughs> like my own company. Mm hmm. Um, but there's part of me that feels that I probably should get out there now, you know, like yeah, it's time. go meet some new people. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So what are some positive consequences that have come from I don't belong? You've just mentioned one, you know, it looks like you fell in love with yourself and learned to love your own company. What else are some positive consequences from holding that? Well, People love to be around me, you know, they just want to want me to give them a hug and all that kind of stuff. That feels really good. Mm -hmm. It feels weird too <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. Because you're like, why are they hugging me? I don't belong. So why am I getting this attention? Why do they want to hang out with me? Because I don't belong. <laughs> right. And also well, so I'm just being me and no one, other people aren't doing that. So, you know, I'm just being me. Yeah. And sometimes I feel you know, when I t talk about personal stuff in a group, which I'm doing more and more now, because mm -hmm. I just want them to see that I'm not the person in front of them. We're all here together holding hands yeah. in a circle, right? Yeah. So when I tell them the story, like I yelled at my son, they go, you yell, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I do. <laughs> yeah. So you're learning a lot. You're learning the the connection and not so afraid of feeling like you don't belong, but this is definitely something that gets to shift. Yeah. Right? At a new level. Some mechanisms for adapting. You can even reflect on this um, after this call when you have a bit more time to unpack this, but um, it would be really helpful for you to reflect a bit more on how you might've adapted to the energy of trying to be accepted. Right. What how that might have shown up. Obviously, we know with your family in different ways of perhaps judging them to protect your own feeling of feeling like you don't belong, trying to figure out why and other little things. Right. Other little things that might show up. And in terms of business, exploring that, too, how it might have shown up in there, too. And it might just be like if if you're marketing something and not liking marketing something a big reason for that could be, and you get to discern this for yourself, but it could be that when people don't show up or sign up, it could trigger that feeling of like, I'm not good enough because I don't belong because of all these things, because I'm different, all these things. So then marketing doesn't become marketing. It becomes a possible trigger for not belonging instead right. of what it, marketing, what marketing is. And I hope this helps other people on here. All it is, is inviting someone into something that can help them. Yeah, that's all it is. That's how I think of it. Every single time I market, I'm like, I'm inviting someone who might change their freaking lives from being a part of this. That's what it is. And how would they know it's for them if we don't market it? Right. Mm -hmm. It's like gatekeeping a really awesome thing <laughs> that can help people.
But if we think we subtly don't belong, then that marketing piece, if people don't sign up or people don't join, it's like, oh, it could be a potential trigger for that. But we want to heal that, right? Yeah. Because what is so untrue about Deborah not belonging? Why is that a lie? Honestly, because I'm awesome. It's <laughs> just not true. I it's know not. that. It's not. And let's zoom out on like a universal level, like a spiritual side of things. What's not true about not belonging? That we're all, we all belong. We're all connected. Everything is, is together. Everything. Yeah. There's no way not to, even <laughs> if we wanted to, there's no way not to, because we're all connected. And even in this human experience, which you mentioned, you love being human in this human experience, there's no way not to belong. We're a part of humanity. Zoom out even for some people who don't like being human. You're still a part of the collective cosmos, the oneness of us all, right? So there's no way not to. But let little Deborah didn't know that. Yeah. But is it true that just because she incarnated in a family that maybe was different than her and that maybe didn't understand her, is it true that that means as a soul she doesn't belong? No. No. So Deborah, is it true that you don't belong? No. No. Is it true that you ever were on the outskirts? No. Why not? Because I can't be. <laughs> There's no outskirts, right? There is no outskirts. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So I want you to take a deep breath and feel the energy of this. Tune into your energy field. Become aware of your energy around your body, moving through your system. Is it true that you don't belong? No. In the absence of the world of feeling like you don't belong, if that world can no longer exist because it's simply not true, in the absence of that, what world becomes available to Deborah now? The world of connection, the world of openness, authenticity, joy. Which is dancing. what you love so much. <laughs> dancing. Yeah. Yes, dancing becomes available to you. Yes. Yeah. The world of connection, the world of dancing, of course, because dancing is such a divine connection to your body, mm -hmm. right? So that becomes connect uh, available to you in the world where you know you belong. So go freaking dance because who cares what it looks like? Who cares if you're not in flow in that second? Who cares if it's not for like, just go do it, mm -hmm. right? That becomes available. What else? Feel into this world and feel into the energy of it around you. What becomes available to you in the absence of that? My energy, my vibration, for lack of better words, is more aligned and connected to money, to the flow of everything. Yeah. Yeah. And that feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> Fuck yeah. Fuck I feel yeah. Really good. <laughs> Amazing, Deborah. Amazing. Oh yeah. my goodness. Amazing. All right, Deborah. So we have some beautiful things for you to move forward with, a different reality field, a fuck yeah reality field that you're in yeah. now. Right? Mm -hmm. Amazing. So these are the energies I want you to keep playing with, dancing into, moving your body into, and also connecting with the flow of things you said. That's already healing the physical body. Anything going on with it, right? Because that's stagnation with things. I don't know exactly what was going on in the body, so I, I want to just honor discernment here. But think about any disease, right? A disease in the body or any disorder in the body things flowing again is creating healing in the body automatically. Yeah. The body wants to heal. Yeah. And it knows how it's a master mm -hmm. healer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing, Deborah. So know that even that that's opening up for healing. That's already healing in the world where Deborah knows she could never not belong. Mm -hmm. She is a part of it all. Yeah. And she can rest in the safety and in the home and in the security of that. 
I love the way you speak. I love the words you use. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. This is really beautiful. And then you have the recording of this, but I also want you to take the time to really play into the world of knowing money is an amplifier. That's it. And every time that someone invests in you, they're investing in all of this and your ability to heal even more people, your ability to spread this work, your ability to do this work, and also your center that you're opening. Right? Amazing. All Thank right. You so much. Of course. Thank you as well. It's such an honor and such a blessing. I'm really grateful to connect with you. It feels really special and that you come up here and just know I'm I'm here with you. You know, I'm I'm celebrating you. I'm I'm honoring you. And at the same time, it's just been a real blessing to work with you and get to know you. Thank you. Deborah, please keep us updated, okay? I will. And what's coming through for you now? Yes. <laughs> that app, that group app is so hard for me to manage. And you said, keep us up to date. I'm like, okay, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's a different, that's a different, a, a little bit of a different narrative that maybe one day we can get into, but um, it's okay. It's okay. You don't, there's no pressure on that. Just know that. All I meant is that, you know, you can come on here and share a comment. You can just go in there and send the message and not look at any of the other messages. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but also I just wanted you to know that you, I care, you know, I want you to know that I deeply care and I want to know how things are going for you. You know, that's what I really meant by that. So however that looks for you is perfect. Thank you. Okay. Amazing, Deborah. Lots of heart pounding and tears. It's great. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Such a pleasure, Deborah. Such a pleasure. Do you feel complete for now? I really do. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. And I know that you've helped a lot of people with this too. Thank you. Go serve. Go build that business. Let's do Thank it. You. Go build that center. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. Amazing. Awesome, everyone beautiful so special a lot of people saying thank you deborah just in case you couldn't see it gabriel said thank you deborah um, annie baker said that was amazing deborah great job so you're just getting some love in the chat and we will bring another person up tonight i'm feeling good i will keep going as long as you guys want to keep going um let's go to jennifer next jennifer go ahead yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Like I felt it this morning and I got so nervous. And like my cats were all like sitting around me just before I left as well. I um, saw that. And <laughs> your cats were surrounding you. I saw that. I could feel it. Um it's mainly like you saw my questions like in the chat about like, you know, not not quite um knowing which what of what is meant to be and what is our choice. And there were so many community answers, uh, and I think that's something like to explore. But then, just yesterday, your last podcast talked about health and all this, and it just and today is World Diabetes Day, so I just yeah, it just really felt like I had to talk to you about this because like my question is, if some of these things are, if everything is our choice, is how can I, you know, sometimes bad things happen, but they're good. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. um, basically, but, but um, I'm just going to jump in before you even ask that yeah. question. So if bad things yeah. happen, but then they turn out to be good, then are they really bad? No. Interesting, isn't no, it? Not really. Interesting. Isn't yeah, it? because basically what happened, like four years ago, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, where basically your insulin making cells are just like destroyed. You know, I thought mm -hmm. to do with COVID this happened. And it was the worst time of my life. I was in Korea. I didn't have any friends. Um, and it, it, it was bad. Like, I, I was ready to jump the street kind of bad. Yeah, um, but then because of that, I met the best friends I ever had in my life. I, I joined international conferences. And I did interviews. And because of that interview, I got to trigger the world people on the demonstration. Like the what highest did you just say? You got to trigger, you got to what? Because of those interviews, what? Train, um, because of the interview, I got to train with the World Taekwondo demonstration team. And Amazing. those are people that have done Taekwondo since they're like five years old and I'm not that level, but they invited me. 
Um, so last year I had the best year ever, like performing with this team on the stage. And if you had told me that when I first got diagnosed, like, hey, you get diabetes, but you're going to go on the stage with them. Like, I'd be like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it didn't happen that way, right? And then, like, okay, so, like, diabetes was fine. And then this year, I suddenly got really, really retired. Like, I couldn't perform with the team anymore. I got exhausted. I, I had no energy. And you saw some questions as well about healing. And because mm-hmm. of that tiredness, you start, I found you, you know, mm-hmm. to, like, actually look into all of this. Um, and now, you know, later, 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 it turns out um, it, my, my thyroid is being attacked as well. Mm. You know, it's called Hashimoto. So it's like my body is like attacking itself, but I get lots of great things from it. And I'm a bit like, can I, can I like change that? Like, you know, if you told me like, yeah. you're going to lose an arm, but you get $5 billion, I'd be like, yeah, okay, I could lose an arm. But you don't know these things. And it's, I would really like to learn my lesson mm-hmm. without losing parts of my body. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I really resonate with that. And you're just, Jennifer, you're amazing. You're amazing to be able to see and persevere through these things. Because I know you're saying this in a way of like, these good things just happened, but you had to have hope and persevere through those things for those things to happen. Do you know what I mean? So that's it. Yeah, I mean, I had had hard times, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, but you persevered. So the rewards came from your perseverance. And even when I got tired and I was so sad that I left the demo team because they train like, you know, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day. It's something that I'm near 40. I cannot kind of keep up. But because of that, I started archery and now I'm a horseback archer, which is something I wanted to do 10 years ago. And I was like, who does horseback archery? And again, it happened because I was so tired because of my thyroid. And it's like, I have so many amazing opportunities. But then I, I, I'm kind of stuck somewhere. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you don't want them to keep showing up in your body. You don't want these intense things in your body to show up for you to make a move, right? Right, right. Yeah. So, so tell me about the energy that, hmm, tell me about your idea of like uh, transformation. Maybe, maybe we'll start there. Tell me about what you think it takes to transform or to get what you want. What do you think it takes to get what you want? There's definitely sacrifice. You have to sacrifice. You have to miss out on a lot of things that you want so that it eventually gets better. Okay. Like, I know that that's not true sense. anymore, anymore, but that's definitely an old story. That, well, like, now let's lean into that story. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. doesn't it? You have to sacrifice yeah. a lot to get what you want. So what has Jennifer sacrificed to get what she wanted? Well, I always thought I put in a lot of effort, you know, like training and physical effort and time effort and not meeting this much for doing all this. But, but, but yeah, my, my body has all right. Yeah, your body. So, so that narrative works in one sense because that narrative works to get Jennifer to freaking go for it. Like you are perseverant. You commit to things. You give your all to yeah. things. And what we want to clear up is this idea that sacrifice has to happen for you to finally get to those things you really want. Because what is a different word to describe for Jennifer going all in on something and giving her all to something? Instead of calling that sacrifice, what else could we call that? Passion. I'm always told I'm like too passionate. Like I'm getting too much, but but I love being that way. It's yeah. I would call it too. We could call it passion. We can call it devotion. You know, people say to me, they're like, "You work a lot." I'm like, "I'm devoted to what I do. I'm in love with this. That's why I do it. I love every second of it." Right. So it's devotion. It's passion. So is that sacrifice then? No. So then because of the story, I'm I'm going to jump in here for a second. So thank you. Mm -hmm. But so because of the story, if that's not the sacrifice, because you love to train, then what became the sacrifice? Father. Yeah. What's the the sacrifice? I can't, if I put all my energy into this one, that means I don't have energy. Yeah. And energy is limited. Yeah. I think that's what I ended up with. Yeah. So then what became limited in your own body? 
how it functions because like, I don't have energy to recover. Yeah. Because I used to go. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Getting it. It was the first narrative too that you have to sacrifice anything and what you've sacrificed is energy and what you've sacrificed is energy for your body to recover. Right. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's a lot different. Like, I thought it was like so far back. Like, oh, you know, like because my parents are pretty much like, you know, that's the way it is and things are hard and they're like your usual story. So I thought I had to dig there. But I think it's a lot more just my understanding of energy yeah because you don't live a life yeah. that just like oh things are hard you have a lot of amazing things happen for you you know what i mean like yeah. your dreams are <laughs> yeah. coming true and you're living like multiple lives you know you went from like yeah, this yeah. Amazing opportunity on stage to like now you're doing archery like you're doing what you want right. that's it's not a world where things are hard you've proved that wrong to them but what there is right. a world is this world of sacrifice and this world of limited energy that Jennifer thinks her energy can run out and she needs to sacrifice something to make these other things happen. But let's stop doing that. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be great. <laughs> what do you think? You want to stop doing that? I'd, li I'd like to keep the rest of my body. That would, that would, that would be amazing. Like, I want to yeah. have the energy to do all the things. I have more plans and Yes, you do. And you are going to do these things. Let's do this, right? Okay, so what's the first thing that's incredibly inaccurate about energy that you think about it? What do you think about energy? I know energy is unlimited, but I have told myself the story that energy is limited. Exactly. And that's not right. And that's that's inaccurate, right? With With every single smaller than a centimeter of empty space of the particles that make up this whole universe, there is the amount of energy in them that is equal to the whole universe. Right. That's in every little particle that makes up everything. Um, Nassim Haramein is a great scientist to listen to. He talks about this in a more scientific level. So if you ever want to get your... Um, like logical mind on board, you can listen to some interviews with Nassim Haramein who talks about that. But that's infinite energy and he's not who tuned into it. Nikola Tesla tapped into it. He tapped into the infinite energy in the universe. But that same infinite energy in the universe is what makes up every cell of your body, Jennifer. Every single cell of your body and every less than a second is popping into the quantum field of infinity and back out. In and out, it's going. The only reason we think that it's solid and stagnant and the same is because our eyesight is limited to only see based on the speed of light. So we don't see that we're not solid and not stagnant. We don't see it happening. But every less than a second, your body is going back into source and coming back in. It's popping in and out of existence. The only reason that you, your body, you think it's the same is because of how powerful your mind is. So really and, every second I have the chance to kind of stop my autoimmune reaction. Exactly. In a way. In, yeah. But but what we want to do is it's not Jennifer stopping the autoimmune reaction. It's Jennifer stopping whatever story is creating it so that her body can just heal. Your body knows how to heal, Jennifer. This is what we meant when I was talking when Deborah and I were talking. It's something Deborah knows really well as a healer. Like she knows the body is a master healer. That's what we're talking about. Your body knows how to heal. You have something called the autonomic nervous system in the body that kicks into gear and sends a, a stream of healing chemical cocktails, like a chemical cocktail of healing in your body on a regular basis. Your body's just doing that. What we want to do is clear out whatever story is making Jennifer think and stop her body from doing the healing that it knows how to do. Which one of those stories, for sure, if not the story, is something we uncovered today. 
where it's like the body wanted to heal, but it was being told it didn't have enough energy and it needed to sacrifice. Yes. Yeah. I, I definitely did that. I was like, oh, I don't have time to cover Oh, okay. I've had this conversation like 10 times with you in my head and every time something else came up, this wasn't one of them. So <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it's the blind spot. It's okay. This is why, yeah. this is why we do this, right? Support, the blind spot. I get support in my blind spots too. It matters. We can like run in circles around these things kind of when it's a blind spot. Right. Yeah. yeah. So Jennifer, is it true that you have a limited amount of energy, well, not even limited, right? Because our body doesn't need to rest. This is true. The ego will pop in. If we say that Jen Jennifer is just unlimited right away, the ego construct will pop in and say, well, the body needs to sleep. And it's like, yeah, it, of course, it gets to rest. It gets to recover, but it doesn't need to sacrifice anymore. That's what we want to clear up. So is it true that Jennifer needs to sacrifice her body to get the things she wants? No. Do you want to keep living in that world? No. No, it's not true. No, I want I want the easy world. Yeah. So what world though, Jennifer, becomes available to you when you know you don't need to sacrifice to get these amazing things? I will have more energy. And I can just live my passion without being held back. And what was yeah, the only I, thing that was holding you back? Just thinking that I had. Yeah. My own thinking. Yeah. My story. Just a story. And it wasn't even know. your story, right? It was just a story. And it was a byproduct of whatever you learned growing up. It was. Mm -hmm. However, do you still want to carry that story? No. Is it even accurate? It's not accurate, no. So who do you get to be? What's the new story that gets to replace that? I get to be strong and energetic and just passionate about everything I do. Yeah. And then what do you get? What is the new relation? I feel like you could go like run right now. I feel like you could yeah, just I want my bike like to work right now. And I'm just like, no, it's like, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, I feel the energy. It is amazing. Okay, okay. Uh, so, but I want to support you in really anchoring this in for a second. And then you can go right away to work. Okay. So the next step of this is that what relationship do you now get to have to your body? I can throw away this idea that like, you know, the older you get, you need to slow down. Like, I, I, I don't, I've seen 80 year olds at the gym and I can be yes. one of them. And I can, yes. Yeah, there's way more I can do with my body. Yes. <laughs> so you can let your body know that, that, that it's safe to heal. You can let your body know that at any second we take a deep breath, we can tune into our healing energies. You can let your body know to use the joy you have for life to heal. You can let your body know that the happiness and the excitement and pushing ourselves is an amazing thing and there's no way to run out of energy in this universe because you can tap into infinite energy. You know what I mean? It's not even you that gets the energy. It's the entire love of the universe that's animating everything. So it's not even you that has to go get or generate energy. The universe is just doing that. So you can let your body know that know now that the story is gone and it's free to heal now. It's safe to heal. Thank you. I don't need it. I don't need to. Yeah, it's it feels it feels so much more like yeah. I don't even need to fix it because I just need to get out of the way. And you already did, right? Thank you so much, Sarah. It's amazing. Oh of course it's so well, special to talk to you i know how much you've been putting into this so it warms my heart to get to talk to you and, and share this moment with you go sh go ride to work and let your body feel amazing <laughs> now with every second oh, well, I think we're gonna go run <laughs> what i'm gonna go run tonight as well it's like oh yeah. i really wanted to exercise now <laughs> amazing jennifer amazing all right amazing so do you feel complete for now yes i do thank you so much of course jennifer my honor have a great day at work.
Thank you. Amazing. All right. Wow. How beautiful is this? Just so beautiful. All right. What do we think? Can we do one more? Can 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 we hang out? I know some people have dropped off, but what do we think? One more? couple more, depending. August, good to see you again. <laughs> Saw that you signed in a little bit ago. Amazing. All right, beautiful beings. So let's go to Katarina. She's next on the list. Katarina. Yes, hello. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Um, Where are you from, from, Katarina? What is your accent? I'm from Slovakia. Uh, yeah, so it's almost midnight. Uh, uh, so yeah anyways uh thank you very much for uh this opportunity and i really appreciate your work i've been following you for a long time and uh, uh i myself am interesting interested in uh, uh reprogramming limiting beliefs um uh so and uh, i have some blind spot um uh, around uh, i would like to generate uh, uh, income um, and be uh, financially independent uh, for my husband and uh, I've been uh, uh, working on it for over a year um, or, or longer and uh, uh, I don't know what, what's going on but um, yeah I, I've always struggled to find my life purpose like what, what I should do in life and uh, I tried different things and uh, um uh, wasn't really successful but uh, before i met my husband i i had a really good job and uh, then after i married uh basically uh i i didn't have uh, that good job anymore and uh, then i stayed at home with kids and uh, i was still searching myself like what shall i do and um, i was always in the spirituality since childhood so um and I was always studying spiritual books and uh, really keen on this. So uh, uh, after I did some uh, coaching and uh, I had mentor and uh, well, somehow we figured out that I should be a, a life coach. Uh, and uh, I was interested in uh, removing limiting beliefs and manifestation and this stuff. But um, uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, I started my business and uh, uh, it's it's over one year, but I, I don't get any clients, like paying clients. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out like what's going on because I will really don't want to be dependent anymore on my husband and I want to have my freedom and uh, live my life on my own terms. But um, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if, if this... Uh, life purpose which I figure out is is uh, not correct or I, and I should try something else or okay, okay. Uh, what, so what is blocking yeah. me in, in yeah. getting clients. So. Okay, so let's, let's dive into this. I feel like I have a good amount of information. So thank you for sharing and thank you for being here. And I really honor you too for just speaking. I don't know if it's a second or third language, but being so articulate and self-reflective in that is is really powerful. So I just honor you for that because it's not easy to do and it's really powerful. So thank you. Okay, so Katarina, if money didn't matter, what would you do? Uh, yeah, I, I really like deep conversation with people and that, uh, that is always really uh, has lighted me up uh, that I would really like to talk uh, to people about spiritual things. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why I thought like... Uh, mm, being a spiritual coach and that I always have something to offer people who are not that much into spirituality and would like to find their way. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so if money didn't matter, would you just do, would you do more of this? Uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would still like to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be, yes. uh, I was even thinking I would like to be some kind of uh psychic or, or a medium or as a channel mm -hmm. um, because I would uh, rather uh, 
not, not provide my opinions to, to people, but uh, really to channel the, the highest knowledge or highest wisdom, uh, which wouldn't be like my own opinions of, of a human, but um, um, yeah, to, to give people something which is which is real, because I, I was misled many times by people who uh, claim to be like a spiritual uh, teachers or something like that and or, or psychics and uh, uh, yeah so I, I was I was thinking about like uh, bridging science and spirituality as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. amazing so it sounds like you know you like doing this <laughs> <laughs> sounds yeah. like you know that Right, and if money didn't matter, you would just be doing this and exploring more of it and exploring. Maybe yeah, uh, yeah, like you know, growing spiritually, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and then helping well, others do it. Yes. yes. Amazing. Okay, so that feels clear. So let's get into the money side of things and the business side of things then. Right. Okay. So you said it's been a year and there hasn't been paying clients. Yeah. First, I want to bring this to everyone. This is really natural. It just is because we go into this work and we want to serve and we want to share our stuff, but then the stuff comes up that could be in the way of us marketing, of us running a business, of us doing that whole side of things. And it isn't about Katarina not being meant for this. It's about let's clear out whatever is blocking the financial income in relationship to this. Because you said something very spe specific. You said not paying clients. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you've worked with people and supported people? Yes. Yes. Yeah. But not paying. Yeah. Okay. So tell me what's going on in relationship to money and you making money. Oh, I would love to make money. <laughs> I, mean, to. I, I love money and... Uh... I think I, I, I don't uh, find any limiting beliefs towards money. Uh, okay. So that's so why tell I'm me saying, about, yeah. yeah. So tell me about then this uh, relationship of wanting to be financially independent from mm -hmm. your husband. Yeah. Right. Okay. So tell me about how that feels for you to be financially dependent on him and to want to be financially independent from him. What does that feel like for Katarina? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I want to be free to to go where I want, when I want, and to do what I want. Uh, so uh, uh, this is my desire to be free, uh, like really uh, not to be limited. Yeah. And uh, since since the money is not actually mine, then I'm limited. Uh, well, well, it's not true, but you think you are. Mm-hmm. Okay. The very idea that you think you're limited is the very reason that you're in a world where it seems like you are. Okay. Because know. right now, right now, and we'll, well, we're going to dissect this, but right now, could Katarina go into another room if she wanted to? Yes. Yeah. Would you say that you're free to do that? Yes. Could Katarina go outside of her house if she wanted to? Yes. Could Katarina go to the store if she wanted to? Maybe not at 12 a.m., but could she if she wanted to? Yes. So is it a categorical truth that you're not free to do what you want? Well, but if I want to go to retreat to Costa Rica or, or Bali, then I can yeah, yeah. because I don't have the money for that. And uh, then I'm you limited. You think that, you think that. But the thing, the thing about money is it's not about the money. This uh -huh. is what we get confused. We okay. think that it's that we don't have money that we can't do that thing. But the reason that we can't do that thing is because we think we're not free to do that thing, which is why we don't have the money to do that thing. So you said something to me that was very, very, that wasn't very, but wasn't fully accurate. So just be with me in this moment. Is it true? that Katarina is not free to do anything she wants right now? Yes or no? Uh, Katarina is not free to do anything she wants, yes. She's not free to do anything she wants. No. But tell me why that isn't true. 
Well, it is true. <laughs> well, tell me, tell me why it could possibly not be. <gasps> if Katarina really wanted to go to Costa Rica, do you think that she could figure it out? Mm. But, but well, yes, probably. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We're starting to unlock the prison. Mm -hmm. So do you think, Katarina, if you really, really wanted to co go to Costa Rica very soon, do you think that in the infinite possibilities of this universe that you could have a potential to just figure it out and go? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Already, we're dissolving this prison of Katarina thinking she can't do anything she wants. Which that is where the opportunities for things to happen come. We think it's about the money, but really it's about the idea that Katarina thinks she's not free to do what she wants. Is this making sense now? Is it starting to connect? No. <laughs> okay. All right. That's okay. So do you, do you live in a world where you perceive and are aware that your reality comes from you? your own perspective, that you experience reality based on your perspective. Could you agree with that? Yes. So if you have a perspective that you think you're not free, then what would the experience be? That I'm not free. Yeah. So then if someone thinks they're not free, do you think it would make sense that they would have money as a limit that makes them not free? to yes. reinforce that yeah mm -hmm. that's what i mean by it's not about the money the money is the byproduct of the idea that katarina is not free mm -hmm. is this starting to make sense well i i don't know if if i can well how how can i confirm that uh that it's, it's dead but uh makes sense like it could be yes yeah so do you perceive that you are experiencing reality based on your own perception? Yes. Yeah. So could you see potentially that someone who has a perception that thinks they are not free would then have experiences in their world that re reaffirm that to them, that reinforce that idea to them? Yes. Okay. That's what we're talking about here. So Katarina, tell me about where you learned that you weren't free. I guess uh, in uh, in the kindergarten when uh, I had to go to sleep when I didn't want to uh, sleep. And uh, yeah, I was forced to stay in the bed and uh, yeah. Uh, so when you were in kindergarten, yeah, I, I I couldn't leave the kindergarten even though I didn't want to be there. Yeah. And what did that feel for Katerina? What did that make her feel about herself? That she's what? Limited. Yeah. That she's not free. And yeah. someone who's not free, what might they think about themselves? That they're what? Limited and what? Prisoner. What was that? Prisoner. Prisoner. Yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. Yeah. And if someone can't do something that they want to do, what do they feel about themselves? Oh. Limited, I don't know, not free. <laughs> yeah. yeah, limited, not free. So yes. if someone, then we go on the other side of things. If someone feels like they can do anything, I want you to tune into yeah. this energy, that mm -hmm. someone's walking on the planet and they feel like I can do anything. Anything is possible for me. What does that person feel like? They feel like, like, like a God. Like a God, which is what? Gods are what? Almighty. <laughs> Almighty and powerful. Powerful. Mm -hmm. So if okay. someone feels like 
they can't do what they want, what would they think about themselves that they're what? Yeah, like weak, that they are weak. weak. Powerless. Powerless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So feel into that energy and tell me if that feels like it resonates. Yes. It does? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as a little kid, though, little Katerina, was it true that she couldn't leave the kindergartner, kindergarten because she was powerless as a soul? Well, not as, yeah, well, at that time, yes. <laughs> well, well, think about on a soul level. Just mm -hmm. because there's rules in kindergarten, does it mean that she's powerless as a soul? Does it mean that that's who no. she is? No. No. What does it mean? That means that uh, she's, as a soul, powerful. Yeah. But? But in the, in the 3D world, uh, she's limited. Well, she wasn't limited. It's just that there were rules in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. There She's are still not... rules in my marriage. So well, uh... well, well, that's that's what we're gonna unravel when we get there. So stay oh. with me in the kindergarten, right? There are only rules in Katarina's marriage because she thought she was someone who wasn't free and was powerless. The rules are a byproduct of that old energy coming with. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yes. But you are, I, I hope that this this lands for so much, so many of us right now. But Katarina, you are such a powerful being that you have created the illusion of a limitation to make you think you're not. And then reality reflected that to you. That's how powerful you are. Yes. But what do we think? Do we think we would like to use your power in a different way now? Yes, sure. For sure. Definitely. For sure, right? So now, as a soul, was the young Katerina, as a soul, did it mean that she wasn't powerful because she couldn't go out and not nap when she didn't want to? No. No. What was going on? Oh, uh, she she was powerful as a soul, but uh, um, couldn't go out because of the rules in the kindergarten. Yeah, she thought she couldn't go out because of the rules, mm -hmm. because she was a powerful soul, but she also wanted to be a good girl. She wanted to follow what someone else said for her, so she could be yeah. good, yeah. right? But if Katarina really wanted to, could she have just ran away from that kindergarten? Well, and actually, I did. Um, that makes sense. Yes, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> and they 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 brought me back, obviously. Uh, yeah, but one yeah. day I I really ran away from there. <laughs> yeah, because you as you as a soul, you were making it mean in that moment that you weren't powerful, that you were trapped. Yeah. But there's something in your soul that wanted to rebel, which is exactly why you ran away. Yeah. But right now. The biggest form of rebellion is knowing that none of that means anything about you as a soul. And that when you change that within, these things around you are going to start changing. That's how powerful you really are. This is what we're starting to unravel. So Katerina, where were you born? In Slovakia. Slovakia, okay. So if I were to cut you open, would I find a physical manufacturing label inside of Katerina that says, name is Katerina, born in Slovakia, I am powerless, and I'm not free to do what I want? Would I find that on a manufacturing label? No. No. So if I can't find that on the manufacturing label as evidence inside of you, then where does that evidence exist? Well, uh, in my mind. Yeah. And what is that evidence made up of? Very logically, what is it made up of? I'm 
I'm not free to do what I want and I'm powerless. What is that made up of? Of fault. Of what? Of fault. Of faults, of, yeah. And words. Of, of things, like thinking fault. Oh, oh thoughts, yeah. thoughts. Yeah, thoughts, yeah, yeah, thoughts. Mm -hmm. Another another word for that is words. Sorry about that. Yes. But words, right? It's just words. Yes. yes. And just Katerina, words. if it's just words, that means that you have the power to change it. Yes. It's just words. It's an idea that a young version of you made up before she knew better because she didn't know any different. When she was little, she made that experience and probably a couple other others that reinforce that make made that mean that as a soul, she is powerless. Yeah. That who she is, is powerless and not free to do what she wants. That's who she defined herself to be instead of the awareness that that was just a passing experience. What this is like when we make things mean something about us is like getting inside, what kind of, uh, maybe it's not the same as Slovakia, but it's like me getting inside of a Jeep, a car, and saying, I'm a Jeep. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. Instead of the awareness of knowing, for now, I'm in a car limited to the experience of driving on a road. But that doesn't mean I'm not free to go off the road when I want. Because who I am is not a Jeep. It's just the passing experience of driving it. Mm -hmm. Who Katarina was, was not powerless. It was just a passing experience of being an infinite soul who's all of a sudden a little kid who has to follow rules. But what she decided about herself is being a Jeep in that moment, being powerless as who she is. Yeah. But is it true that who Katerina is, is powerless? No. Tell me some evidence of why that isn't true. Oh, uh, yeah, well, because uh, as uh, I, I manifested some kind of a nice life and uh, 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 I manifested many beautiful experiences and uh, I basically am free to go to the shop and uh, <laughs> what not. So I have uh, these powers. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that there are many experiences which prove that I am not uh, powerless, but I actually have the power. Yeah. And now we're going to get rid of wherever the remnants of I'm powerless and I'm not free to do what I want. We're going to get rid of the remnants of that so that Katarina can know that she has always been free. So is it true that you're actually not free to do what you want? Well, still to some extent, it is it is true because uh, well, it's some, true because yeah. you're deciding it and holding on to the story that it's true. Mm -hmm. But if Katarina is it, let's go in a different direction then, so yeah. I can better support you, right? Because this is gonna the the idea that you can't do what you want is a byproduct of I'm powerless. Mm -hmm. So let me support you in a different way. So, is it true that you are powerless as a soul? No, that's not true. It's not true. Has it ever been true, even though it might have felt that way as a little kid? Was it true that as a soul, you were powerless? No, that was never true. No, there were just rules that you wanted to follow, but also wanted to rebel against because you wanted to know that <laughs> you were powerful. Yeah. So Katerina, is it true that you are powerless? No. So right now with me, if you were to step into a world where you could never feel that again, you can never feel powerless because it's never been true and it isn't true now. What world becomes available to you when you know you are not powerless? Uh, yeah, well, lim lim limitless world. Like, uh, if, if I'm not powerless, then I'm powerful and uh, I have these powers. Uh, to, to do what I want. Yeah. So if you have the power to do what you want now, 
do you think in that world it becomes available that you have the power to build your business and start making money in it? Yes. So do you think that even though for now you might not utilize your husband's money, who is supporting you to do some things, do you think that for now you might agree that you might not utilize his money to go to go to Costa Rica, but you are powerful enough to make money in your business and then go when you want? Does that possibility uh, feel possible to you? No. <laughs> no. Do you think you are powerful enough to make money in your business? The world where Katerina knows she's powerful, do you think it becomes available that you can start, start making money in your business? Yeah, well, it's it's really hard to believe it uh, after so many years that I uh, was not able to do it. So Yeah, do you um, still want to live in that world? No. No, then let's stop using it as evidence for now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you did not make money in your business, Katarina, because you couldn't do it. Okay. You made money because there was no way not to reinforce that you're powerless if you think you mm -hmm. are. It's like if we're born with, you might have heard me say this before, if we're born with blue lens glasses, then what color would the world be to you? Blue. That's what we think, but it wouldn't to you. You wouldn't know it's blue because that's all you know. Mm-hmm. It's the lens you're seeing the world through. So no matter what happens, you wouldn't even know it's blue because it's just how the world is. So if you look back to the lens of seeing the world through I am powerless and I can't do what I want, then of course you didn't make money before because you were seeing the world in a way that must reinforce what you think about yourself. Make sense? Yes. So do you want to keep using evidence of Katerina's world of I'm powerless as evidence for what's possible for you now? No, definitely not. Definitely not, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely not. So from that energy, Katerina, could it be possible that you can be powerful to build your own business and make money from it? Yes. And how does that world feel for you? well good very good yeah like <laughs> yeah is it Amazing. true that you're powerless oh uh, no <laughs> in a world where you're powerful what becomes available to you take another breath into it start to feel it in your body in a world where you know you've always been powerful what becomes available to you well anything what i want and do you want to make some money in your business? Yes. <laughs> Let's freaking go. Let's yeah. go from the energy of I'm powerful. The only reason it's happened in the past is because it had to, because I was seeing the world through that lens. Oh, yeah. But that's not real anymore. It doesn't have to be my reality anymore. Did you ever see the movie Divergent? No. I invite you to watch it. it, it if you're a little sensitive to some violence, it's not intense, but it's some violence, okay? So if you're a little okay. sensitive to that, just let me know. And I invite everyone to watch it. And I'm going to okay. give away the scene, but the scene is going to land differently when you watch it now. Because what's happening to Katarina right now is what happens in the scene. She's in a cage and the water is filling up and she feels like she's about to die, right? She, she's like chaotic trying to get out until a moment happens where everything stops and she says, this isn't real. She taps on the glass lightly and it shatters and she's free. That's what's happening with Katerina right now. Because she was living in a world where it was filling up in the world of I'm powerless, I'm not free to do what I want. Until the moment where we see it's just words, it isn't real. I'm powerful, I always have been, and I'm powerful to go start my business and really go now. Can you feel that? Yes. All right, let's go from here and then see what happens from that place. Does that feel good? Thank Kat? you so much. Of course, of course. How do you feel now? Yeah, I feel like uh, the veil was lifted and that uh, uh, I uh, actually saw uh, the limiting belief which I held or the identity even. Uh, if it yeah. Was, yeah. 
So now what gets to happen, Katerina, is that the mind's natural tendency does what naturally happened with you today. And this is great for everyone. The, the prefrontal cortex, what it does, it's the part in the front of our brain. It looks for evidence of from the past to tell us what's possible for yeah, yeah. what's coming. So it's a natural mechanism, but we're evolving beyond the natural, natural mechanism and being the creators. Instead of responding to an old reality, we're saying, I'm creating my reality. So what we get to do is have so much compassion for the past versions of Katarina that really thought she was powerless. We can have so much compassion, but we're not going to use that version of you for evidence of what's possible for your business anymore, because that's not who you are. You are powerful and you can do this. Yes. That's the Katarina, right? So I want you to wake up as this you, the you that remembers that she's powerful. I want you to fall asleep as this you. And I want you to create everything you create in your business from this you, okay? And keep us updated. Let us know what goes down. Okay? Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> of course, Katarina. Thank you as well. It was beautiful to connect with you. Amazing. Yeah, me too. Sir. Thank you. All righty. Beautiful. So special. Oh my goodness. Oops, I clicked stop video. I didn't mean to do that. I just meant to um, unpin, move from spotlight. Awesome. All right, beautiful being. So that was so special. And I hope that those of you I didn't get to today can come back and raise your hands in the next sessions. Thank you for being here. And I hope you also got a lot of support from just watching. Because I know that this happens like as, as much as it's meant to. And I invite you to self-reflect on a different level on whatever you raise, you were gonna raise your hand on. Pretend you're talking to me when you reflect and like let what came through today support you and allow yourself to support you at the next level from this too, okay? But thank you all for being here tonight. It's so good to see you. Jenny said it helped a lot. It's beautiful to hear, Jenny, amazing. It's so beautiful to see you guys again. I know there's a lot of faces that are returning. There's some new faces. Thank you for being here. And from this energy, thank you, August. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you. <laughs> he, he's like, he hates what I call him out, but like kind of loves it, but like kind of hates it. And I, I don't know. I just vibe with you big time. <laughs> so he's running away now. He's gone. He's gone. Okay. So thank you all for being here. I really appreciate every one of you. Like I mentioned before, the mastermind starts this Saturday. If you can swing it, I really invite you to join in. It's an incredible six month journey where you are trained in how to do this yourself and all the ins and outs of this. There are a lot of nuances to this, right? But you will learn how to do this for yourself in that mastermind. And if anyone really needs some kind of a scholarship or sliding scale, just message me. We'll get you on the inside, okay? We'll make it happen for you in a way that works for you too. All right, beautiful beings. Thank you for being here. You can go ahead. If you have any smaller questions, you can add them in the chat and I'll get, get to them when I can and riff on them in a voice note. And just please share some love with the people who shared tonight in the chat because it takes a lot of courage and they've helped so many people with it. So if you can, you have a moment, share your reflections, share some encouragement in the chat and I'll see you all next month. I'll see you on the podcast in between and in the chat group in between. Thank you all so much. It was such an honor to be with you tonight. So thank you. Bye for now, beautiful beings. <laughs>